Welcome back, everybody. So today we're continuing on with ancient Greece, and today's subject is going to be the Peloponnesian War. And I should also mention the crisis of the fourth century. We're going to look at these two critical events in Greek history today. And so what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to focus in on this. The Peloponnesian War and the fourth century crisis were devastating to Greece. How? List the senses that this was true. So it's going to be devastating on multiple different levels. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to think about that as we go along and perhaps take notes on that. Okay, first thing that I want to mention is I want to review what has been going on in Greece. We talked about 5th century Athens last time, and we talked about the creation of the Delian League, and the Delian League is pictured here in uh, yellow. The Delian League, of course, was originally founded to um, put a break on the Persian Empire to defend Greece, but we saw that it was eventually turned into a type of Athenian Empire of sorts. And Athens' aggressive nature began to alarm other Greek city-states, particularly Greek city-states who were not yet in the League and who feared that they might become uh, victims of Athenian aggression. And this was especially true of Athens' near neighbors like Corinth and Thebes, but also true of, of Sparta. Sparta looked warily on the rising power of Athens. And so Sparta created its own league, or really just expanded a league that already existed, the Peloponnesian League. You'll recall the Peloponnese is this area, let me pick a color that's good here, this area down along southern Greece, it's a peninsula. Sparta is the dominant power on that peninsula. And so they had created this Peloponnesian League earlier, but it was renewed because of perceived Athenian aggression. It was joined actually by states even outside the Peloponnese. Well, it wouldn't take long before these two groups came to blows. And before we talk about that, I should mention the differences between the two leagues. The Peloponnesian League, unsurprisingly with Sparta as its leader, had a very strong infantry. It was able to muster more foot soldiers than the Delian League was. Sparta was an oligarchy. And Sparta tended to promote oligarchies wherever the Peloponnesian League was uh, dominant. And this was because Sparta valued organized government, uh, non-chaotic government order, and it was largely believed in the ancient world that oligarchies, a few, a few crazy people are easier to control than, a f and than you know, 10,000 crazy people. The Peloponnesian League didn't have a very strong navy, had a few ships, but really quite weak compared to the Delian League there. And the Peloponnesian League was poorer, didn't have as much money, it didn't have this extensive empire. Well, the Delian League then, if we focus in on this, was the opposite. It had the best navy, maybe on the planet. It was rich had extensive overseas colonies and trade, um, various silver mines. It was very wealthy. It was also weaker, as I mentioned, when it came to infantry. Didn't have as strong an army. And as I've already mentioned, the Delian League also was democratic in nature for a variety of reasons. And go back and look at the section on 5th century Athens where I explain why that is. Now, <laughs> I should mention 
Sparta and the Peloponnesian League hailed themselves as liberators. Remember, Athens' control over its league wasn't always voluntary. And so Sparta could really portray itself as the liberator of the Greeks, in the sense that the Athenians were, were tyrants of sorts. Now, when war finally did break out in 431, Sparta's strategy was pretty simple. Go up and kick butt. Yeah, the, Athen the uh, Spartan strategy was to go up, use its superior army, get the Athenians into the field, and smash them, and end the war really quickly. Quick, decisive blow to the nose, and Athens would come to its senses, hopefully. The Athenian strategy was a little more complicated. The Athenian strategy was not to go out and face the uh, the uh, Spartans. Uh, they rightly concluded that this would be suicide. And their strategy was to go behind the walls of Athens. Now, Athens is located about four miles off the coast. And so it's capable of being surrounded. But I had mentioned in the section on 5th century Athens that under Pericles, the Athenians had created long walls. These were walls that would connect Athens inland to its port, the Piraeus, which was just off of the coast of Athens. And the long walls were about four miles long. Now, the strategy here was the Athenians knew they were vulnerable to being besieged and starved out. But as long as they had a connection to their port, and as long as their navy dominated the waters, this could never happen. Okay, and so they could continue to feed themselves. And so Athens really brought its whole population behind the walls. And their strategy was really to wait it out. They knew that the Spartans couldn't stay for very long. They knew that um, they had plenty of money. They could feed themselves. And so they really went for the long game. In the meanwhile, while Sparta came north to fight Athens, they would send their navy out to harass the Peloponnese, which would have been left unguarded to try to stir up helot rebellion, slave rebellion among the Spartans and to wait for Sparta to give up. Unfortunately for both parties, they were wrong in their calculations that the other side would give up. The Peloponnesian War is going to turn into a very long and costly war. I mentioned that typically, wars among the Greeks had been relatively quick affairs. One side, one city-state goes out, crashes into the other city-state, quick, decisive encounter, and the war is over. And that was true for the most part up until the Peloponnesian War, but this was going to be a war that was going to last for almost 30 years. So much longer than the weekend um, wars that the Greeks were accustomed to. It was also different in its scope. Roughly all of the Greek city-states were involved on one side or another. And so rather than it being the typical affair of one city-state A versus city-state B, it was now going to be every single polis involved in one side or another, almost every polis. Well, Greece was ill-equipped to deal with this type of war. Now, if we were going to talk about the Persians, they could continue a long war because they had a professional army. In other words, the job of the Persian soldier was to be a soldier. But in Greece, this wasn't the case. They didn't have professional soldiers. Soldiers were part-timers. They were farmers for the most part. And 
this was fine when it's a quick engagement, when it's a one-week war. You can be away from your farm for a week, but when you're talking 30 years of war, well, this is going to put a lot of strain because if farmers are out fighting, then they're not out um, they're not out working. And so this had an increasingly big cost on the Greeks. Now, you will perhaps remember from an earlier lecture, I said Greece isn't that rich a country to begin with. It has some pretty poor soil. And so to have this sort of thing going on is going to be very taxing on Greece. And so this brought about incredible economic distress. And it was compounded by the, by the nature of the Peloponnesian War. Part of the strategy in this war, since it went on for so long, was to try to destroy the economic resources of your opponent. So for example, when the Spartans came up to Athens and the Athenians retreated behind their wall, the Spartan strategy was to burn crops, destroy things, and kill livestock in the hope of starving the Athenians out. And the Athenians would do the same when they were on Spartan territory. And so both armies went back and forth and back and forth across the course of this war, destroying things as they went along. And this, as you can imagine, caused widespread famine. And some of the losses would take a long time. Um, you know, uh, maybe wheat will grow back next year. But if you're destroying vines that are used to make wine, well, those take years to grow. If you're cutting down olive trees, one of the biggest sources of export for Greece, those can take decades to grow. And so this is very, very costly. It was also costly in terms of financing this. Um, you may remember that I said that the way that naval ships were financed was the wealthy would support a ship, the adopt a ship program, if you will. Now, as more ships are required and more crews are required, this starts to become enormously expensive. Well, with all of the economic distress and devastation, I should mention that this also caused all sorts of internal turmoil inside of the city-state. A lot of smaller farmers who lived on the verge of starvation anyways, even in decent years, when their crops are destroyed, well, you're in really hard shape now. For many of the wealthy, they also resented paying for these taxes. Meanwhile, many rowers thought that the war was great. If you're a rower in the Athenian Navy, well, there's a lot of work, right? Because we need a lot of rowers. And so you end up getting this class dynamic where poor farmers feel like they're being put out. Maybe they're losing status. Maybe they're being forced to sell. Wealthy patrons, wealthy individuals who are paying for these boats through their liturgies, they're really resenting the, the cost of this all. And on the other hand, you might have some rowers maybe some of the lowest of the low class, and they think the war is great. And so you have this dynamic where there's a lot of turmoil as people go hungry inside of the city-states. And so what you have is something called, what the Greeks called, stasis, S-T-A-S-I-S, -S -S. stasis. And stasis is internal conflict. It's a cancer to the city-state. When you have different groups of citizens, depending on their, their class, supporting different things. Another troubling development, at least from the Greek perspective, 
was the increasing use of mercenary warfare. A big part of Greek citizenship, a big part of the polis, was the fact that it was defended by its own citizens. The, the dream, the ideal of the polis was citizens fighting on behalf of their own land. Well, it quickly became apparent to states like Sparta and Athens that in some ways it was much more cost effective to keep your citizens at home farming and to pay to have lightly armed troops fight on your behalf, right? If you could pay at a reasonable price to have other people fight for you or to supplement your own army at least, then it might be worthwhile to turn to mercenaries. And a mercenary, of course, is someone who gets paid to fight. And so there were plenty of poor Greeks now that the war had broke out, people who were on the verge of starvation. And so states like Athens could take some of these people and give them light amounts of weaponry. And they could be fairly effective, not as good as a hoplite, but they could definitely hold their own, harass, and increasingly states turn to mercenaries hire for pay but of course these are people that aren't loyal to the polis these are people who are doing it on some form of a professional level okay well as i mentioned the war dragged on for about 30 years and Athens could have won it had they been a little uh, smarter if luck had gone their own way. Um, Athens' big mistake was to try to expand the war out to Sicily. Um, we won't get into the details of why they attempted to do this, but suffice it to say that their military adventures um, met an unfortunate end, and they were severely weakened in the course of this. Uh, still, they would have probably been able to carry on had the Persians not become involved. We haven't talked much about the Persians in the course of this. The Persians were watching. The Persians were fearful of Athens for good reason. Athens had already expanded somewhat into Asia Minor. And so the Persians threw their weight behind the Spartans, um, basically financially. They built the Spartans a fleet. They financed the Spartans, and with a weakened Athens, with Persian money, the Spartans were eventually able to grind down the Athenians and force them to surrender in 404 BC. Athens could have done worse in this piece. Um, there were members of the Peloponnesian War that wanted to kill all the Athenians and sell the women and children into slavery. Um, Sparta wouldn't allow that, but contented themselves with breaking up the Delian League, tearing down the long walls, and installing a pro-Spartan oligarchy in Athens, and as the official government of all of the former members of the Delian League. So, Delian League was broken up and became oligarchies. Okay, well, war is over. We can go back to living in peace, right? Wrong. As the 4th century approached, and so the 4th century, um, we're talking about the 300s. gets confusing, but we're talking about the 300s. Um, things did not go back to peaceful relations. Um, Sparta didn't prove to be the liberator that they had promised. Um, they proved to be pretty intrusive into the affairs of many of the Greek city-states, and even some of their former allies began to resent them. And so 
it didn't take very long for the Peloponnesian League to break up and for new leagues to be formed. And so former enemies like Corinth and Athens now found themselves on the same side. And the fourth century is really just a confusing picture of different groups forming, different leagues forming, different hegemons, hegemons are leaders of the league, all trying to form alliances, all trying to um, get the upper hand. And what this means is continuous warfare. Not quite on the same level as the Peloponnesian War, but um, destructive nonetheless. And of course, Persia, always in the background, always prep playing spoiler, playing one off against the other. And so rather than having peace after the Peloponnesian War, instead you get 70 years of more intermittent warfare. And this is called uh, the age of hegemonic rivalries. Okay, well, 70 years following upon 30 years, my math tells me that's about 100 years of destructive warfare. And you can imagine that this was exhausting on the Greeks. The same problems from the Peloponnesian War, economic devastation, class conflict, the city-state torn between themselves, between people who favored democracies, people who favored oligarchies, the rich versus the poor, um, mercenary warfare, people being paid with no loyalty, just following the, the dollar, and ceaseless unending war, exhaustion. And so, by the time we get to the uh, mid-300s, Greece is in a bad way. Greece is crawling around on its hands and knees, and it's just waiting for an outside power to come and to put an end to it. So, what I'd like you to do is I would like you to think about this question, the Peloponnesian War and the 4th century crisis were devastating to Greece. How? List the senses that this was true. So we talked about several different senses that this was destructive to Greece, destructive to the polis. Tell me about those, or at least write them in your own notes and um, use them for your ultimate discussion board question. By the way, if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, join, um, you can join the, uh, my channel, subscribe to it, uh, leave a comment, and uh, I'll see you for the next lecture.